Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm here to introduce today's webinar entitled Advances in Protein Detection and Quantitation Methods, Learn the Crucial Differences and Limitations. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and EMD Millipore. EMD Millipore is the life science division of Merck KGAA of Germany and delivers products and services for life science research in academic and pharmaceutical environments. The recently launched Direct Detect system exploits EMD Millipore's membrane expertise to enable IR-based measurements of amide bonds in protein chains without relying on amino acid composition, dye binding properties, or redox potential. With the Direct Detect system, users obtain rapid, accurate, and reproducible protein quantitation, even in the presence of reducing agents and detergents, and in sample volumes as low as 2 microliters. Current Protocols is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 15,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. We have allotted one hour for today's program, but our speakers have agreed to stay on a bit longer to answer as many of your questions as possible. You can submit your questions throughout the event by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom right side of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Dr. Paul Wingfield is the director of the Protein Expression Laboratory at the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases at NIH. Nuno Gonsalves is the Manager of Novel Biomolecular Detection at EMD Millipore. A very warm welcome to both of our presenters, and we'll begin with Dr. Wingfield. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you for the invitation to, to give this presentation. And, of course, I would like to thank Wiley and Millipore for sponsoring it. I'm going to cover some of the, the basic methods that are currently used for the detection and quantification of proteins and peptides. Now, why do we want to determine protein concentration? And I've listed a few of the obvious reasons. My my own emphasis of our lab is that we purify proteins for characterization and for structural determination. So we need to have robust protein purification schemes and methods which have been where the mass balance of the purification schemes has been determined so that we can develop reproducible methodologies. Once we've purified the proteins, we wish to characterize them, of course, and we need to know specific activities, biophysical properties and things, and these require known protein concentrations. Of course, if you're in the clinical or medical field, you're going to do diagnostic measurements of antibodies and antigens. And in the biotech company, you need very accurate uh, methods for determining protein concentration for drug dosing. And I mentioned a couple of other things. And I'll mention something about quantitative proteomics at the end of my talk. Some of the factors that we need to consider before we undertake protein assays of course, the, 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 the amount of protein available, the concentration, the specificity of the assay. We may use assays early on. For example, if we're doing a purification they, with crude protein extracts, that may not be the method that we want to use later for the pure protein. And the assays themselves have, spec, have certain specificities of, of detection, and I'll mention them as I go along with the talk. Most methods are interfered by buffer reagents and things like that, and again, I'll mention that. And of course, we need an easy and reliable method. Often, we're dealing with recombinant proteins, and we can find out a lot about the protein from the sequence using some of these sites. I mention a site here where you go on, and there's a proteomic tools for giving you molecular weight, calculating absorption spectrum, etc. And then, of course, we need to know is the protein an enzyme, an antibody, or antigen, et cetera. And that, again, will give us a handle on how we can assay and quantitate it. And is the protein, if it's a recombinant protein, it may be tagged, typically, for example, with a histidine tag. Again, it gives us a handle on the protein. So as I mentioned previously, the purification of a protein is the first step in determining its structure and function. And protein purification 
is summarized in a table where we quantitate the various steps. We look at recovery, and it's usually accompanied by an SDS page where we can visually see the purification. And so we we want to take a we want to take a protein in a crude extract here. These are proteins that we've expressed. We want to purify the protein, and then, for example, we want to determine its structure and function. This is a um, classical protein purification table for an enzyme. And we can calculate the um, yield and the purification factor based on enzymic activity. For proteins that don't have enzymic activity, we can generate this same sort of table by having specific assays for the protein, whether it be SDS page, HPLC, etc. But this sort of mass balance is important, and especially if you want to present a purification scheme to a journal, they're going to ask you for a purification table. Now, of course, many of the, often we're dealing with insoluble proteins, recombinant proteins, and we have to include refolding steps. So here again, we need to know what the recovery of folded protein is, and that's normally soluble protein. Again, we need a protein determination to, 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 to get a handle on that. Here are some of the methods that I'm going to discuss briefly. At the end, I'm going to summarize them with a table that gives some of the detection range, etc. And then following this, I'm going to talk about some immunological methods and finally mention about proteomic-based methods. Here's some of the equipment that typically needed in the lab. A UV spectrophotometer is an essential piece of equipment in a biochemistry lab. Fluorimeter, somewhat optional. Microplate readers of increasing or lesser complexity for reading absorbance and fluorescence, for example, in the microtiter plate format. And of course, gel related equipment. Reagent kits are sold by many, many companies. And the only thing I say about reagent kits is that these companies have spent a long time optimizing them. The only thing that annoys me personally at times is they include magic unknown reagents. If you're worried about the components of a reagent kit, go back to the original references, or you can even go to the patent where they filed a patent on it and get the composition of some of these kits. This is the UV spectrophotometer that I use in the lab. It's a diode array-based machine, and it gives you a full spectrum in a matter of seconds. Just a word or two about cuvettes for a spectrophotometer. You can see you can have greater or lesser path lengths. The longer the path length, you can look at more dilute solutions, and the shorter the path length, you can look at um, more concentrated, and typically we use a sort of one centimeter path length. You may want to use glass for anything over 320 nanometers or disposable cuvettes for some of these dye binding assays where the dye can actually stick to the, the cuvettes. This is a micro plate reader that I have never used, but it's, it's a nice image and it uses these sort of micro titer plates. And as I say, you can measure fluorescence intensity, absorbance, etc. So the most common method actually in, in my lab that we use UV absorbance. And typically we're using it with purified proteins, but you can use it with any, any, any sort of protein. And typical in the near UV region, the absorbance is dominated by tryptophan mainly and tyrosine. And the, these are the molar extinctions for these, these residues. In the, far UV, in, the, sorry, in the far UV region, we're actually starting then to measure the, the peptide bond, and it's not dependent on composition, although there is some carryover of the absorbance of tyre and trip. And if you look at typical absorbances, a 1 mg per mil protein is going to be about 1 OD, whereas in the far UV region, you can see the values creep up, creep up significantly. Uh, the peak is at 192, but you wouldn't use that because of the. Uh, you, you probably need to purge out all the oxygen to be able to read that. But two, uh, 205 nanometers is typically used to monitor HPLC columns and measure peptides and things like that using this sort of empirical equation to get a, a sort of concentration handle. And as I say before, this is not dependent upon the composition. If we have a purified protein, 
and it's a recombinant derived. We usually know the sequence, and from the sequence we can calculate the protein absorbance and the molar extinction coefficient simply based on the content of tryptophan and tyrosine and the disulfide using these sort of empirical equations. And uh, this is the initial reference. I think in Chapter 3 of the current protocols, we have a more extensive article that goes into this calculation in much more detail. We do need to col correct for light scattering, and you can use this type of plot to um, correct it. And as I say, the, these values calculated from absorbance are very accurate to usually within 5% of, say, the value you determine by quantitative uh, amino acid analysis. And they're certainly more accurate than dibinding assays. Now, an absorption spectrum is more useful than a single OD reading. Here's a couple of proteins. They basically have the same aromatic content. This contains nucleic acid and this doesn't. And you can see that if you just took a single reading at 280, you would be um, in, in error in determining this protein. These two proteins, just a matter of interest, have masses of about three to four million. They're nucleocapsid proteins, and I put the light scattering correction for these proteins. You can correct light scattering just by doing a simple linear plot along, along here. Like, for example, if you just do that, that's pretty close. Now, if you take the composition, the aromatic composition of these proteins, you can make models simply from the amino acids or from, from calculated databases. And some of these bioinformatics sites will actually calculate the spectra for you based on composition. So it's always comforting to see that they're, they're matched, except here in this one, in the top one, it's not matched because of the, of the nucleic acid content. Um, okay. Here's the absorption of nucleic acid. This is DNA. I just grabbed this from my lab book. You can see that it's dominated by 260, and RNA is similar. And you can use these sort of uh, formulas that you see in the literature to actually measure concentration, give you a rough idea of protein concentration in the presence of nucleic acid. Now, you may be lucky and your protein has a nice prosthetic group or something like heme and the proteins are colored and then you can use your eyes as a spectrophotometer and it's fantastic being able to follow red proteins running down columns and uh, things and you can use the extinction coefficient of the, uh, of, the chrom of, the, of the chromophore to actually measure concentration in the presence of other proteins, cytochrome C for example. And here's some other examples uh, that, that, that are listed. You may want to create your own look in terms of absorption by actually incorporating amino acids. And if you, for example, in E. coli expression, you can use an oxytroph for tryptophan and incorporate um, modified tryptophans. And th these have different absorbance to the tryptophan in protein. So you can monitor that particular protein in the presence of others. And people have used that successfully for both detection and binding studies. If you incorporate a unique cysteine into a protein, or there may be just you may have may have just one cysteine, or you can delete others, but one cysteine will give you site-specific labeling, and then cysteine is the most reactive group in proteins, and you can tag it with all sorts of labels and things that you can use for detection and quantitation. Fusion proteins are also commonly used, and the most famous, of course, is the green fluorescent protein, and uh, I, I don't need to go into that. Just to mention, however, that the denaturation of this protein is, results in a lot of in, in quenching, and this is used to monitor protein folding. And I give a reference at the bottom, which is very interesting, because it actually uses the green fluorescent protein to look at denaturation when proteins are bound on a surface. And this is important when you do immunological assays. If you directly bind proteins on a surface, it's not really commonly understood that you can denature those proteins. So for some of the immunological assays that I mentioned, it's important to be aware of that. And uh, as I said before, histidine, histidine tag proteins uh, are useful for monitoring and detection. Just one word about imidazole. Imidazole shouldn't absorb because you, you use that, of course, to, to, to delete the proteins from the affinity columns. But most 
grades of imidazole that you buy have very high absorbance at 280, and it's annoying if you want to use spectroscopy for looking at your proteins. I think there are some grades of it that are okay, but normally you, you have to get rid of it. And the HIST tag itself can be used for immobilization and detection on gels, and there's a, a reference that I give there that, uh, that, 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 in, that shows how this is done. Now, I'm going to mention some of the common colorimetric methods, and these are the methods that many people are probably most familiar with. And here's a couple that are, are very popular, the Bradford method based on Kumasi blue binding, when the Kumasi blue binds basically to basic groups and hydrophobic, so there is some, some sequence specificity there, the absorbance changes. Now, the, and there's this BCA method, which is based on the biuret reaction, and biuret reaction is where copper is reduced, and then the copper is forms these, these complexes with the dye, and these, these, these are used to, to monitor. And, of course, you can get lots of kits and information from the manufacturer websites. I will say that with all these assays I'm going to mention, the devil is in the detail. And you, if you look at the manufacturer's sites, they'll give you lists and things of things that you can and cannot get away with in terms of buffer components and things like that. Fluorescent methods are generally more sensitive, and here's a couple that, 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 that I mentioned. One is based on an interesting approach where you bind the SDS, you, sorry, you bind the dye to the SDS coated protein. You know, SDS binds quantitatively to proteins, and this forms a ternary complex, which then you can monitor um, by, by fluorescence, either by the fluorimeter or on plates. Um, this method here, the other method here, um, re uses uh, amino acid, uh, amino group derivatization. So it's actually a covalent modification, and this again is, is very sensitive. And Life Technologies, which will own every company selling these kits eventually, the way they're acquiring, will give you lots of information on it. Now, interfering substances can be removed. Uh, you can either just go go with them there and take into the, them into account based on what the manufacturers have said, or you can actually remove them by precipitation. And if you do precipitation, you need to include a standard spike in a standard to, to measure the recovery. Or what I prefer is I use these small-scale gel filtrations, uh, these little columns that you can run in a couple of minutes, and they work very, very well, and you can desalt the protein, put it into anything, within a couple of minutes, so very highly recommended. The, the next slide, I, I discuss the protein as a standard curve, and of course, this is fairly obvious uh, how to construct this, but there is a nice reference given from Thermo, a PDF download that gives you some details how to construct the standard curve. And normally you use bovine serum albumin, but of course you can use any protein you wish, and ideally it would be your own protein. And this just gives you a little bit of detail that you may or may not be aware of on how to construct these curves. The next method I'm going to talk about is SDS page in densitometry. This is something you're probably all familiar with. And I just mentioned a case study here. This is a, pro a project I was working on a number of years ago. We were working on the production of the surface antigen from, from HBV, hepatitis B virus, and it's the coat protein, and this is the first recombinant vaccine. So if you have a hepatitis B vaccine, it's derived from these coat proteins on the virus, and when the protein is expressed in yeast, it's non-glycosylated, and you can see here that it's a single band with some dimer. It's a very, very cross-linked gel, uh, disulfide cross-linked protein, so there's always a little trace of the dimer. The, the normal authentic antigen is glycosylated, one of the chains, but this is still efficient as the vaccine, and this is most of the vaccine is, is derived from yeast. Now, we wanted to develop a method for, a simple method for following our purifications. It's independent of the physical state. We need to see where the protein was going, etc. And so we used a densitometry and SDS page method. And I draw your attention to the bottom panel here. 
where we use Kumasi blue staining. So this is a standard amount of all these proteins that are all the same amount of protein. You see there's a little bit of variation with the normal standards, but our particular protein, the surface antigen, has a very, very low staining index. However, with silver staining, it has a much enhanced signal with silver staining. And this was the method then that we used, and we calibrated a curve here, and this was linear up to about 1.5 micrograms. So just you, 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 this is an example of where, you know, the, the, you, you need to really check what your staining index is if you're using. With Kumasi blue, this protein is low, very high with silver. Now, amino acid analysis is where we determine the amount of amino acids in a protein. So it's considered the gold standard because it's independent of any, of, of any other considerations. And normally we hydrolyze the protein, we derivatize these amino acids, and then we resolve them. And we can either do it by pre-column derivatization, as shown here, I, I give a web reference where there's a lot of details on how you do this. It's a very, it actually is a very specialized methodology. Or we use an old classic amino acid analyzer. There's probably not many of these hanging around now, but this is based on what we would say is a post-column derivatization with ninhydrin, and we use a cation exchanger to resolve the amino acid post-column derivatization. And in the current protocols uh, book, and there is uh, more details about the derivatization used for amino acids. Most people, I think, outsource this amino acid analysis, and there's a particular site that we've used, but there are lots of others. Here is a summary of the routine methods of quantitation that I've discussed so far. And you can see that amino acid analysis is the only one that really detects all the amino acids. Um, and the others all have some sort of bias one way or the other. And, uh, yeah, I think and the range of detection uh, is, like I said, the, the fluorescent methods are more sensitive than the, the dye binding. And I, I, I think this is pretty self-evident. Now, what about peptides? We can use the colorimetric assays, especially the... Um, the uh, BCA method where we did the biuret, so it's preceded by the biuret reaction, but the biuret reaction needs about three or four amino acids, so there is that reservation there. Uh, probably the fluorescent methods I me measured are probably okay, but for very small peptides, there's a little bit of a question mark. You have to probably look at that on a case-by-case -case thing. The SDS page, just to comment, if you're running SDS page of small peptides, you need to use a high percentage cross-linked gel, and you might want to include some urea in the gel to increase the resolution. And you may want to cross-link the peptide onto the gel with glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde to prevent gel leakage while you're staining and manipulating the gel. UV absorbance, as I mentioned, um, can be used and is usually used with HPLC both 205 and 208 to monitor HVLC comms. Amino acid analysis, mass spectrometry uh, are the most commonly used methods here. Now, immunological-based methods, um, I'm just going to mention them very, very quickly here. There's the, the ELISA method that you're all probably very familiar with. Radioimmune assays are not used so much, but there was a time when you used to have to radioiodinate your proteins with I-125 and be very, very careful, but that's, that's not used much, although these methods are very sensitive. And, of course, Western blotting, um, dot blotting on membranes uh, is, is also commonly used. Just a comment about the antibody. As you know, antibodies against conformational and linear epitopes, and if you're doing Western blots, you don't always renature proteins after the manipulation. So... You may want to think about actually generating a antibody uh, either against peptides or a denatured protein if you're going to do a lot of Western blot work. Now, the basis of quantitative ELISA and Western blotting is based on the, I have the little uh, schematic here where you have your primary antibody detecting a protein. Your secondary antibody is typically an anti-species, anti-goat, anti-rabbit, etc., enzyme-linked. And the enzyme is then generating 
a color reaction or a light reaction or so forth that you use to 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 to, to monitor the reaction. And the most sensitive are based on chemiluminescence and you need a fancy luminator camera or a device like this for doing those measurements or simple x-ray film. So for the enzyme linked, we can use chromogenic substances, the chemiluminescent substances, and here I've just tabulated some of the properties in terms of sensitivity is lower with the chromogenic compared to the to, to the uh, luminescent methods. There's a very, very good overview on, on all of this, um, and I've given the reference at the bottom from KPL, so that's well worth a look over to get more detail about these, uh, this approach. There is also a very nice re reference that you can go online to look how to quantitate Western blots using this freeware software from the NIH. And this is a detailed, very, very detailed methodology. And I just say something else you may need equipment is for doing Western transfers is a, this iBlot machine from Invitrogen, which is very economic and it works very, very well. Finally, then, I'm going to mention a few pro about proteomics. And here we are looking at the complex systems and we're trying to look at s small changes as a response to d disease or drug treatment, et cetera. And they require very sensitive assays for identification and quantitation. And most of these approaches are mass spectrometry based. Here we see the, the initial approach was using these high resolution 2D gels, isoelectric focusing and SDS gel, where we have two conditions or two drug treatment, no drug treatment, et cetera. We look at the differences in these, these maps and we excise the bands which are different and then we probably will digest them and then we analyze the peptides by mass spectrometry to identify them. And this reference at the bottom, although it's a bit dated, is excellent. It gives a very good overview of all this technology. More recently, we have these uh, targeted protein quantitation here, and I, I give th th this is a figure from the paper at the bottom which goes into the detail, and often mostly we're using isotopically labeled stable isotope, oxygen 18 and 15, etc., as references, and th they are all driven by mass spectrometry. And I will say that in the current protocols in protein chemistry, we have two chapters, 22 and 23, that go into these sort of methods in detail. And chapter 16 of current protocols discusses mass spectrometry. Finally, what's wrong with simply weighing the protein? Well, nothing, and I would say this is the method I probably use most, but it's, uh, it's a sort of rough idea, and if your protein has a lot of salt and things like that, it's not going to be accurate. But if you have a peptide or something and it's salt-free, weigh it, and it's probably, it's probably good enough, and you can always check by checking the absorbents uh, later. Uh, and I'd like to, well, that's the end, and I'd like to thank you for attending, and happy quantitating and quantificating. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul, for the excellent presentation. We now welcome Nuno Gonsalves, who will be discussing a new IR-based technology for rapid and accurate measurement of protein in microvolume amounts. Nuno? Thank you, Gwen, and again, thank you, Paul, for that um, very uh, fantastic and detailed presentation on current techniques for protein quantification. Um, what I'd like to do now is, um, in a little bit, recap some of what Paul said, but also introduce a new method that we've come up with here at uh, EMD uh, Millipore um, for protein quantification. Not to add to the growing list of um, the, uh, the techniques and, and methods used for protein quantification that Paul described, but also to illustrate why we think we might have a more um, simplistic and better approach for protein quantitation using uh, infrared-based uh, techniques for protein quantification. So to jump into that, I just want to give us a brief historical outline of some of the, deta some of the methods that Paul uh, went through in his presentation. Um, if we start back historically, the Lowry protein assay really came about as an advent of when a lot of biophysicists and biochemists really came into the biology space and, sh and started using their techniques and protocols for um, analyzing and measuring protein. If we think also back then, 
and the advent of uh, both the UV system and, of course, shortly followed by amino acid analysis in 1958 came about really when proteins were being characterized in very simple uh, and simplistic uh, components such as water, even PBS, or a very mild uh, buffer solution. Uh, and in that case, these techniques work fantastically well. But as protein research started getting a bit more complex, the, the methods around them needed to evolve as well. In 1976, the Bradford assay was um, invented really as a, um, a stepping stone for studying proteins in more native solutions with uh, either, say, detergents or the reducing agents to keep them soluble. Following that, the Lowry assay was then subsequently reinvented to become the BCA protein assay, or the Smith assay. Not a major leap forward um, compared to what it was between 1951 and 1985, but again, making it more adaptable to the uh, solvents and the, and the components that proteins were needing to be studied in at that point. Note back in 1957 and 58, both UV and amino acid analysis were introduced roughly around the same time. Today, UV uh, systems are used uh, by and large, and, and, and like Paul mentioned in his presentation, are pretty ubiquitous in a lot of protein labs uh, for the use, for simply the use of protein uh, quantitation and, and, and identification. Amino acid analysis, again, uh, being the gold standard, is not as widely used, mostly because unlike UV, which adapted to uh, to be used without the expert and the cost of it has gone down, amino acid analysis really has not. Uh, and while still amino acid analysis labs exist and most people use them, uh, as a core facility for quantitating proteins, <clears throat> barring any other choice or option, the UV system is still persistent in many labs. But really, it's been more than 25 years um, since the last major innovation, uh, the BCA uh, reinvention, since we've had any, any major innovation around protein quantification. And we hope to aim to change that with uh, the 2012 int introduction of what we call the direct detect uh, spectrometer, the IR-based spectrometer for protein quantitation. So let's um, give an overview of what uh, we mean by improving protein detection with IR spectroscopy. What I first want to establish um, is what uh, Paul also mentioned in his presentation, is that all protein quantitation is essentially relative. We have no real way of actually going in and weighing out how much protein is and exactly what amount is there. We use, for the most part, standards and standard curves established by these methods. You see here uh, not a uh, a non-comprehensive analysis of common protein methods for uh, quantitation. The UV vis, of course, I mentioned, is a common standard now. Um, it's done in both uh, UV uh, absorbance modes and also the visible range for measuring samples, me uh, samples assayed with either the BCA or Bradford assay. Both amino acid analysis and mass spec exist and are used today, mostly because, uh, mostly because there might not be any other resource or proper method uh, like UV or Bradford or BCA that would be appropriate for the protein uh, uh, of, of interest in this case. Uh, amino acid analysis can be costly uh, and can be very uh, expensive and slow, especially if you're sending it out to a core facility, but it can be very precise, uh, which is why it's, it's labeled as the gold standard today. Mass spec is used in its place mostly because, from what we've seen, people don't have ready access to uh, an amino acid analysis core lab or one that's uh, already in their lab, but they might have access to a mass spec. And in this case, we've seen a lot, uh, mostly peptide uh, concentration determinations uh, done by mass spec. Like amino acid analysis, it can be very costly and slow. You'd also need an expert, someone uh, trained on working with uh, the mass spec instrument to get you your, uh, the values you're interested. Uh, and of course, we've also heard the arguments that they might not be entirely quantitative. The techniques we're introducing today uh, with direct detect, which are infrared-based, uh, are not new. Uh, they've been around for a long time, and actually there have been papers written back uh, to the 1950s and 60s. So what we're introducing is not necessarily a novel technique, but a novel application for an existing technique. Previously, like amino acid analysis and mass spec, uh, there's been an expert needed to operate uh, such a, a high-tech or high, um, highly sophisticated instrument like an infrared spectrometer. And these things have typically been, been very costly, between forty and fifty thousand dollars at the low end of today's price uh, in U.S. dollars. What we aim to do with direct detect is try to remove the expert as much as possible and reduce the cost so it be more applicable to uh, basic life science research for for standard everyday protein quantification. So when we talk about infrared based radiation, it's not unlike what we're uh, what we've been measuring with UV based radiation uh, in the past. They're both absorbing different components of the protein in this case. 
In UV-based radiation, which we're all most familiar with, the UV light is absorbing the aromatic amino acids uh, mostly in a protein, which requires an extinction coefficient to normalize and get the right protein concentration out of. In IR-based radiation, what we're measuring is the amide bond absorption of the light, uh, the IR light in this case. What this means is that we don't necessarily need an extinction coefficient to normalize the total amount of protein being measured because the amide bond is intrinsic to all protein uh, and consistent within every protein, uh, more, more so than uh, the aromatic amino acid composition of most proteins uh, if measuring by UV light. Also something to consider is that in the visible spectrum, if we're measuring with a Bradford or BCA assay, those dyes bind more specifically to aromatic amino acids, uh, which is something that most people don't realize when employing these assays. Unlike UV radiation, uh, or UV absorption in this case, what's not being normalized is the extinction coefficient. There's not one that exists for Bradford or BCA assays. So the comparison to a standard curve in that case could be slightly off just by uh, using different proteins as a standard curve versus the ones you're measuring in solution. So what exactly are we measuring uh, in an IR band spectrum? As you can see, there are a lot of different amide bonds or amide bands that uh, are present in a total IR spectrum. What we want to focus on are the two uh, in the shaded regions here, amide 1 and amide 2. We focus on these because in the IR spectrum, they are very unique uh, compared to other components or other bands that might be absorbed in the IR spectrum. On top of that, there are also very narrow bands that we can use um, specifically for quantification purposes. So when we look at these two bands and focus on them uh, solely, what we end up seeing is something like you see in the um, figure on the right. The leftmost peak is what we determine as amide 1, and the rightmost peak is amide 2. And we've got a really good uh, eyeball interpretation in terms of their purity, um, amide 2 being about half the peak height of amide 1 in this case. What's being absorbed uh, for the most part in amide 1, is the C double bond O stretching. That accounts for about 80% of the band intensity that we see there. Also coupled to the CN stretching, which is about 20% of that band's absorbance. In contrast, the amide 2 signal, for the most part we see uh, the NH uh, bending vibrations, which account for about 60% of that peak height, and the CN stretching, which is about 40% of that peak height. Again, what's nice about these two peaks and, and, and why we choose to focus on these is because they're very unique to the protein, uh, to, the, to the IR spectrum, in that no other parts or other components uh, show a lot of interference here, which makes them very clean, and allows us to work with proteins, even in complex mixtures, even in the presence of reducing agents and detergents, because what we're picking up here is mostly the absorption of just amide 1 and amide 2. So, how do we do this? And this is where I'll introduce the direct attack spectrometer uh, that we recently introduced about a year ago now. So what is direct attack? It's essentially three main components if you want to look at it this way. Uh, first of all, it's the detection technology. It's, it's the spectrometer itself. And the picture here might be a bit deceiving. The computer that sits on top of it is actually a very small netbook. Uh, it's about uh, the size of a, an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. So it's got a very compact footprint. And we say it's all in one because it actually does a lot. Well, one thing we need to do in order to measure protein concentration with an IR spectrometer is remove the water peak because water is a major interference and the abundance of OH molecules could swamp out any potential signals. So we've introduced a drying element that's present in the machine to dry your sample, uh, determine its dryness, and then read it for you. The next thing it, that it does is, uh, is the analysis tool, and that's the software associated with it. If anyone on the call um, has worked with or has uh, used an, an infrared machine, they'll likely be familiar with the software associated with it. It's not in and of itself very simple to use. You usually have to do uh, some coursework or, or maybe even read the instruction manual, which is about the, the thickness of a textbook, in order to operate the software. What we've tried to do is make it very modular, easy to understand, and easy to operate. Uh, again, trying to take the complexity and expertise uh, needed from working with an IR system out of it so that you can work with this IR system for protein quantification. You can see in the screenshot there we've modularized the components for input parameters. You label your card, uh, you label what spots are on your card, and you hit the measure button and the processing is then done for you. We've also included some post-processing uh, features to help you analyze your sample even further after you're done 
uh, taking measurements with it. And lastly, we made the IR system application focused in that we focused mostly on it uh, being a protein quantification tool. Typically, uh, IR systems have been used mostly for qualitative analysis, and we decided that we could manipulate uh, an IR system with, by employing our membrane technology and our expertise in membrane, by developing a card-based system where you can deposit your protein that's membrane-based, and also being very quiescent in the MN1 and MN2 region so that you can accurately and quantifiably detect protein there uh, consistently and repeatedly. What's also neat about this is we've made it small volume compatible. We know that in a lot of cases your sample is very precious. So the uh, direct detect system works with only two microliters of your sample volume. That's necessary. So major difference again, just to recap, if you're looking at a protein not limited with, with anything, it looks like uh, the this, this sequence of what looks like marbles on the screen here. With UV light, which is, again, the most common technique, what we're illuminating is really just a fraction of the protein in this case, and then determining the concentration with an accurate and known extinction coefficient. On the right-hand side, however, if we illuminate with IR light, what we're detecting is the amide bond of protein. So the entirety of the, of the protein is really being illuminated here, right? And the difference is in the results of the proteins we get. We can take four different protein types here. We've, we've, we've called out cytochrome C which has a, uh, a chromogenic uh, component to it. Uh, protein A, which lacks uh, aromatic amino acids, making it very difficult to quantify with UV-based systems. BSA, which is a very common uh, protein used mostly in standard curves. And IgG, which is a very common protein that's uh, needing to be quantified uh, with these methods. On the left, you see the FTIR and how much more tightly overlapped all those different proteins are uh, measured on an IR system. The comparison is on the right, where you see the different absorbance units for, this, for those four different protein types. Now, again, without an extinction coefficient, it might be a little bit more difficult to quantify these protein types in a UV system. Also note that the cytochrome C has a chromogenic uh, component to it that adds a lot of absorbance on the tail end of the wavelength for UV systems. What this means and what this translates into are different slope variations in a UV system compared to our direct detect system. Because we're measuring something that's intrinsic from protein to protein to protein, our slopes for different protein types in this case are much more tightly overlapped. The difference you see in that green shaded area is about 3.6% versus in a UV system where you can get different slopes for different, protein, uh, for different proteins that you're measuring just based upon the sequence of that protein, that protein information. Now, again, if you've got an extinction coefficient, this might be, um, reduce for you the variability. But in a case where you're using a Bradford or BCA assay, which might be more common, and you don't have an extinction coefficient because one, uh, a normalizing factor doesn't exist, and your, uh, your dye binding reagent binds a bit more, not, bit more specifically than you thought, these effects of slope are exacerbated. What we can do here with this information is use BSA as a more standard, universal standard curve in this case for measuring all protein types. And what we've done in our system is measure uh, BSA and include that standard curve in our system that comes preloaded in the direct detect software. So we can compare our results to amino acid analysis because at every point in our standard curve, we've measured that sample by amino acid analysis. And these are the, the results we see here. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a comparison of uh, measurements of proteins done with direct detect in the dark blue bars against amino acid analysis as a reference method. And we see four different concentrations, two of them with different mixtures of proteins. Uh, and the two mixtures are made of eight different protein types and the differing amounts uh, of cytochrome C as well, as well as measuring lysozyme and, again, protein A, which lacks uh, um, uh, aromatic amino acids that make it uh, very difficult to quantify with UV-based systems. We contrast that on the right with an experiment done and published in 2007 uh, in molecular biotechnology, which compares uh, seven different protein types measured by different techniques, the, the BCA assays called out here as well as the Bradford, and some fluorescent assays as well. The results of these were then sent out for amino acid analysis and then normalized to one. And the variability you see, basically the, the positive or negative uh, inclines in the, in the error bars there, are the differences between the amino acid analysis results and the results obtained by each uh, individual uh, method and each individual protein. So if you look at that, the variability from the low end to the high end could be up to threefold or more in that case. 
Whereas in our system, because we can compare uh, our proteins to a universal standard or a more universal standard, we can match our results to amino acid analysis, again, without uh, the high cost of sending these, the, the samples out for analysis and the long turnaround time. So to illustrate that, we've got a few scenarios here um, in how we can separate out uh, our samples and our protein readings from uh, cases where there might be some interference caused by uh, certain, um, certain protein analysis methods. Uh, one common case is SDS. And in a lot of cases, we know that the Bradford assay is interfered with by uh, the presence of detergents. Uh, and in our case, what we see in one advantage of the IR system is that the protein spectrum is very broad, and we can get to uh, very unique, distinct protein regions separate from where SDS is being absorbed or other or the, or the, um, detergents are being absorbed in this case, giving us a clean spectrum, a clean signal to quantify off of uh, from protein versus any other components that might be in, uh, in the mixture. The results we see here are the results of measuring um, BSA uh, uh, diluted in either PBS, DTT, and in SDS, which is highlighted below in the red, circled, uh, the red circle on the left. Uh, the result with the Bradford assay is that in the presence of SDS, what you get is a much more reduced signal in this case, which leads to an under-quantification of your protein. In contrast, in the BCA assay, you get more tighter alignment with uh, what you expect. But one thing to note is that while the, while the levels are slightly elevated, the error bars are slightly higher too, which leads to more variability by using the BCA assay uh, as an alternative to the Bradford assay for protein quantification in the presence of SDS. Similar thing goes for the presence of uh, reducing agents. So what we see here is beta mercaptoethanol. And we all know that reducing agents like beta mercaptoethanol and DTT are, for the most part, incompatible with the BCA assay because that assay relies on the reduction of copper ions in order to bind uh, the protein sequence in this case. In this case, the same thing goes for the quantification of uh, protein with direct detect. The DTT, or the reducing agent signal, is far separated spectrally from where the protein is absorbed. So again, we get a clear amid one peak that we can quantify off of uh, without the presence, uh, without the interference of reducing agents like beta mercaptoethanol in this case. And again, the same thing goes, what we see here in the circled area here is the presence of reducing agents while trying to measure proteins. The result, the net result is that you get complete oxidation of uh, your uh, BCA reagent, leading to zero results in your BCA assay. Comparing that with our direct detect system, the two graphs that you've seen on the right are, are showcasing what the results are with uh, BSA measured in the three different um, uh, solvents and glutens. On the left, what you see is the result of all those three with direct detect. And you can see within the standard error, there's a lot more tighter grouping in this case, even in the presence of detergents and reducing agents. Again, mostly because those components are separated from the protein region where we're measuring uh, protein and quantifying it in this case. What this can translate into is effective quantitation of, say, cell lysates uh, without cleanup of your lipid component or even your SDS or detergents that might be in your lysis buffer here. What you see is uniquely spectrally distinct protein in the green shaded area compared to what um, might be showing up with lipids, let's say, in the blue shaded area and other components that are spectrally distinct and separated from the protein region in a much larger IR spectrum compared to a UV spectrum, which is, again, much narrower and a lot more things absorbed within the same region. So how easy is it to use? It's actually quite simple. You just take uh, two microliters of your sample, deposit it on one of our assay-free cards, uh, place it in the instrument, which will dry the sample for you, and when it's ready, it will take the measurement. That whole process roughly takes about two to three minutes per card, including the drying time and the measurement time, and then you, set it, you see the results uh, instantly as they appear uh, on the system and the software uh, that you see on the screen there. Uh, the sample card is composed of a PTFE membrane. Uh, it's very durable. It's very tough. You don't have to worry about poking through it. Uh, what you do is want to make sure that as you pipette, you pipette vertically into the center of the spot there. That ring you see in the center of the spot is a hydrophobic ring so it can contain your sample. And that's key for making sure that we can reproducibly position the sample within the beam path and get quantifiable results every time with, within the same card and within different cards and different instruments as well. As far as standard curve generation, like I mentioned before, the system does come preloaded with a standard curve. 
It's BSA measured in PBS, verified by amino acid analysis. If you'd like, you can create your own standard curve. Uh, the process is very simple. We, we've uh, encapsulated a wizard to help you do that. We recommend using uh, amino acid verified, amino acid analysis verified uh, standard uh, standards in this case. Because the nice thing about this is because there's no assay involved, you can save the standard curve and get reproducible results not just within that experiment, but for the life of your experiments too. The software, like I mentioned, is also very easy to operate. What you see in the top left pane there are input parameters. You label your card, you label your method, uh, as well as the, um, the samples in each uh, spot. Hit the measure button, and it takes your sample, the readings for you, uh, the, the blank in this case. Gives you the output. If you want, it can calculate the average concentration if you're doing things in triplicate, as well as the CV of those as well. And on the right-hand side, you see spectral information. So you see whether or not the, the, the protein you're measuring is clean, is, it's pure, and then you can also expand that to the full spectra and see if there are any other components in there that might be problematic to you before you proceed downstream with any other assays you might be running. We've also expanded our application to be able to detect lipids quantifiably. And essentially what we're measuring in the lipid profile here uh, is the symmetric stretching of either the CH3 or the CH2 bond in this case. Now, one thing to note here is unlike proteins, uh, there are different, uh, there's not necessarily one universal standard for lipid quantification in this case. What we have to do is um, you'll have to create your own standard if you've got one, but in the presence or in the lack of a standard in this case, what you can do is measure relative absorbance. What you see here is different um, lipid profiles, lipid spectra profiles uh, for um, the CH stretching in each one of those. The result of these is, is essentially different slopes, and that slope is really mostly dependent upon uh, the length of the, uh, the uh, aliphatic chain of the lipid profile in that case, which is, again, why we can't necessarily supply a universal standard curve like we've done for protein for lipid analysis in this case. But again, it's a neat tool, especially if you're trying to measure the amount of lipid uh, content in your samples, if that's important to you, or if you're actually looking to reduce the amount of lipids before proceeding downstream with, say, Western blot or ELISA after your protein quantification. If you're interested in reducing the detergents or the amount of uh, lipid content from your cell lysis solution, you can track that, and we've done that here with Direct Detect uh, in the same reading and in the same measurement, both measuring protein uh, and lipids uh, through subsequent spin washes. And we've also been able to improve peptide quantitation with um, direct detect as well. Similar to what we've done with BSA as a more universal standard curve, the same principles apply here with peptides. Uh, with natural sequences, we get very uh, similar patterns of absorbance uh, along the same slope of BSA, in this case in the red line, with three different proteins we've measured here, um, or actually with one, pro with one peptide we measured here in uh, PBS water and DMSO. So the slope variation doesn't change. Uh, in this case, which again leads you to be able to compare your protein or your peptide uh, value to our BSA standard curve in this case, because what we're measuring again is the amide bond of both the protein and the BSA and in the, um, in the peptide as well. Comparing that to weight-based quantitation, what we've done is actually measured uh, weighted material. Uh, and again, like Paul mentioned, a lot of weighted material, if it's salt-free, can be very accurate in terms of its quantitation, but what you don't know is how much salt might be in your weighted material, and that could be up to 10 to 70 percent uh, of your weighted material in this case. And what we've done, again, is compare that weighted material to measurements uh, observed in direct detect. We've verified uh, this with uh, amino acid analysis, the results of which can be found in our peptide application note found on our website, um, where you can get more information about how we use uh, that to quantify uh, peptides, in this case, for more accurate peptide quantification, again, based upon the principle of amibon absorption and comparing that to a more universal standard that is BSA measured by amino acid analysis. So just a quick summary of the features of direct detect. Uh, again, we don't, uh, we're not interfered with by detergents and reducing agents, uh, which means that your accuracy is comparable to amino acid analysis, and there's relatively no need for a buffer exchange in most cases when trying to measure protein with our system. We don't need an extinction coefficient, again, mostly because we're measuring the amide bond of protein and not something that uh, is unique or specific to the sequence of protein, like the aromatic amino acid. So there's no need to run any colorimetric assays like the Bradford or BCA assay, and your quantification is independent of your protein sequence. We can detect proteins as well as peptides and, and even lipids quantifiably with a relative standard curve in this case. 
What this means for you is that you can determine more of your total sample composition, have more confidence in your results before moving downstream to your experiment. And a lot of these things are not possible, like I said, with UV, mostly because there's absorption within the same region of, say, lipids and proteins uh, in the UV spectrum. Your samples can be spotted in ambient conditions. There's no need to, um, uh, to, to, to keep them cool because the, um, the system dries your protein in order for accurate quantification of the, of the protein in this case. This means that even for a short time, you can archive your samples and reanalyze them. If you didn't have confidence or you wanted to rerun the sample again within the next few hours or maybe the next few days, depending upon your protein stability, you can put that same card back in the machine and reanalyze it. And again, it requires minimal sample volume. Only about two microliters is needed. This conserves precious samples, and unlike colorimetric assays where you might be able to analyze two microliters, you still have to commit a lot more protein to the assay itself in order to be able to be analyzed uh, in two microliters. So that's uh, it for my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for your time. What you're seeing on the screen now is basically the uh, slogan that we've gone out with. Uh, we are differentiating ourselves based upon our ability to uh, walk away from and uh, not use Bradford assays, and it's not just Bradford assays in this case, it's, it's BCA and other colorimetric and fluorescent assays too, uh, with IR-based quantification. Again, we're measuring the amide bond of proteins, so we have something more intrinsic and more applicable to all protein types. And also because our spectrum is much broader, and those other things that would interfere with other Bradford, BCA, and colorimetric assays are spectrally distinct from the protein region in, in an IR spectrum. So, thank you for your time. I'll start taking any questions now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Nuno, and you're correct that it is now time for the question and answer session. So let's go ahead and see what questions have come in. Uh, this first one, I'm, I would think Paul may be the, the recipient for this. The question is, can a proteinaceous drug like glycopeptides, once made into a complex, can that be detected at the same wavelength as used for the, the simple drug? Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I. Yeah, I, I. I'm not quite sure about that. So, well, what they're asking is, is the. Well, can you repeat the question, please, Gwen? <laughs> sure. Can a, a proteinaceous drug like a glycopeptide be detected at the same wavelength as the simple drug, the the non-glycosylated drug? Um, the glycosylation. I'm not sure how that affects the um, the 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 absorbance, and I think you would need to look at them separately to check them out. But I'm just saying in principle, yes. Okay, great. Um, the next question uh, is for Nuno. Uh, the question is, is the direct detect system as precise as mass spectrometry? Well, the precision will be um, dependent upon the substrates being used. Um, I, I know a lot of people who've used mass spec for quantitation. Uh, and they say that it's not entirely quantitative. Um, what we benchmark direct detect against is amino acid analysis, so we can compare results uh, more directly to that system rather than mass spec. If the mass spec system is probably calibrated well enough and can be calibrated to amino acid analysis, then yes, we can say that the results will match. We've tried to match our results to, the, to what we term as the gold standard in protein quant, uh, and that is amino acid analysis. Okay. Uh, this next one, I believe, is also for Nuno. The question is, can the FDIR analysis be used for bound proteins? Uh, I'm not sure what is meant by bound proteins. Um, I'm guessing maybe bound to a substrate. Um, if that's the case, uh, and if, if, if you could retype the question with just a bit more clarity, I can, I can go back and re-answer that. If it's bound to a substrate, it might be a bit difficult because we do require the protein to be spotted onto uh, the assay-free card. Uh, and that means it'll have to be uh, essentially loose or, or unbound to something uh, in a complete solid form in order to be deposited on the card and then read by the instrument. Okay. Uh, Paul, I believe this next one is for you. Um, is there an advantage of the BCA method over the Lowry method? I think it's just a matter of convenience. Um, the Lowry method, you're going to have to make up presumably most of the components yourself. I'm not sure there is a kit form of it, and I imagine the sensitivities are different as well, that the Lowry is less sensitive, so it's a matter of convenience and sensitivity. Okay. Um, the next one is for Nuno, I believe. It says, is it possible to separately detect slightly different proteins in a mixture with the IR system? Um, 
Both yes and no. Uh, the IR will detect subtle variations in composition. Um, we've seen uh, we, we've seen this case, say for example, between uh, a globular protein and an antibody, where the the max peak will be slightly right shifted in the antibody. What the what the the IR system, what direct detect will quantify is total protein. Now, if you wanted to do some more spectral analysis, if you wanted to take the the the, the spectral prof profile offline and do some um, some post-analysis modifications like a PLS model, it might be possible to do something like that to, to independently check. But right now, uh, what we measure is total protein amount. You can, you can eyeball check and see if the, pro, if the peak is slightly more right-shifted or left-shifted to see what, what the general composition of that protein might be, but we, we won't quantify those two proteins independently, no. Okay. This next one, I believe, is also for Nuno. It says, can the direct detect system accurately measure proteins in a mixture containing nucleic acids? Um, yes and no. Uh, in the case that there is a relatively the same amount of nucleic acids to protein ratio, say, in a cell lysate mixture, then yes, because the amount of nucleic acids in that case is negligible. What you need um, in order to see the nucleic acids in the protein spectra, because we all know that nucleic acids have uh, an amide group associated with them, is roughly the same amount, the lower end of the dynamic range, in order to be detected by uh, the same region in direct detect, so roughly 0.25 mg per mil, which is, as we all know, a lot of nucleic acid uh, as far as contamination goes. Okay. Uh, next one is for Nuno again, I believe. It says, do you have a list of buffer conditions that are compatible with the IR-based protein quantitation system? We do. We have a rough list um, that our sales team goes out with um, uh, and can demonstrate with. Roughly speaking, it's basically anything that has an amide group. Um, but more specific than that, it, it comes down to what amount of that amide-containing component uh, is present in the system and how um, how prevalent or how much of a of a peak it gives you there. Um, say a typical working conditions, TRIZ can be overcomable, uh, say 100 millimolar. Uh, but at normal working conditions, something like urea, which is at 8 molar, is something that we try to avoid with direct detect. Um, so rule of thumb is anything that has an amide group. We do have a, a short list that we uh, go out and work with uh, in terms of common buffer components that might be, um, I wouldn't even say interfere, but, but would show up in the amide region. A lot of cases, in a lot of cases, these aren't necessarily completely overlapping with the amides you see from proteins. They're, they're slightly right shifted, and we've got different analysis methods that can overcome um, the presence of those components. Uh, and, it, and also, it's, it's, it's protein uh, dependent as well. If you have enough protein that can overcome that peak or overcome the influence of another amide group that shows up in that region, we can quantify over that as well. Okay. This next one, um, perhaps both of you might have an answer to this, but I'll start with Paul. And the question is, what would be the best way to quantitate the molarity of an FITC-labeled peptide? Would it be better to use the absorbance at 205 to detect the peptide itself or some other wavelengths to detect the FITC label? I think the, the the label itself would have an extinction, so you could use both. But I think that the label itself normally has an extinction. Now, whether that changes when it's bound to a peptide, I'm not sure. But typically, you would use the extinction coefficient of the label. That's what I would suggest, anyway. Okay. No, no, I didn't know if you had any comment on that with the FITC <coughs> labeled the peptide. The... We, we've not had an issue with, with um, absorption from fluorescent compounds uh, interfering with the measurements of proteins or peptides that we've that we've gotten in the in the amide region for for protein and peptide quantitation. No. Okay. So those things are essentially independent of the amount of protein you'll be quantifying in an FTIR uh, like direct detect. All right. We have time for probably another one or two questions here. No, no, I think this one is for you. It says, do any salts interfere with the direct detect method? So, yes, yeah, some salts will, um, uh, mostly buffer components that are amide-containing like TRIZ. Um, but, again, they have to be in, in relatively high amounts in order to get uh, total interference where you can't quantify a protein off of. What we also say, too, is, is there are a lot of common components, a lot of common salts that will interfere with other, ass other assay methods, methods like the, the UV assay, the Bradford and BCA assay, What's nice about direct detect is even though you can uh, you can see that 
if there's something that interferes with protein quantitation, at least you're able to see it and identify it uh, and potentially do something about it, like clean it up or try to remove it before moving on and actually getting a protein um, measurement out of it. And then moving on comfortably downstream to your next assay uh, or something that matters to you in terms of getting a result out of it. Um, so without going into specifics, like I said, that we do, we do have a list. We have a short list of things that will interfere. Common salts like sodium chloride, uh, are, no, won't interfere. Uh, again, if, if they don't contain an amide group, we won't pick them up in the amide region for protein quantitation and direct detect. All right. Uh, Nuno, this one is for you. It says, can we use the direct detect method to check the concentration of protein within the cell without lysing the cell? That's a great question. Um, I know that the R&D team is curious about that as well. Uh, it's something uh, we'd like to try, but we just haven't tried it yet. Theoretically, it, it might be possible. You will have to destroy the cell, however, because you'll have to get rid of the water content. Okay, we're just about out of time, and so must conclude the question and answer session. Um, but today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next couple of days, and we will send each of you an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar, along with downloading a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to customize and print a certificate of attendance. You can also access the certificate of attendance right now from the Docs and Links tab, which is on the right side of your screen. Uh, and right now, actually, you're invited to complete a very short webinar evaluation questionnaire by clicking on the Docs and Links tab. And on completing this survey, you will be able to download a complimentary copy of the Protein Blotting Protocol Guide and the newest application notes on protein quantitation, which are provided courtesy of our sponsor, EMD Millipore. This concludes today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from current protocols. On behalf of our speakers, Paul and Nuno, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, EMD Millipore, we hope you've learned some valuable information, and it's goodbye for now. Thank you so much for attending.